Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in films, television, and in books. And this video is going to be about chapter nine of Gardens of the Moon, uh, particularly the, the dinner scene, uh, the infamous dinner scene. It's one of my favorite scenes of the novel. But weirdly enough, I think a lot of the discussion about this scene really has to be about how Erickson sets up what is going to happen in the scene. So it's actually uh, a bit of a look at what happens earlier in chapter nine um, and how Erickson sort of sets the table for the, the dinner sequence. And in particular, the thing that really fascinates me uh, about this entire sequence are the power dynamics at play within the characters and obviously how that relates to how we interpret the story and how we interpret what the events are and mean. And a lot of this is the subtext that Erickson works into all of the descriptions and what's going on and how he has the characters act and react in very different ways depending on who is in the room. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting scene. So if you're interested in a brief analysis now of, of this aspect of chapter nine, um, stick with me. If not, I'll see you in the next one. So setting the table for this dinner scene, we, we start off with, um, I'm gonna start off in the section where Lauren's basically arriving in the city. And the first thing to remember is, do Jack suspects that Tayshrin is systematically wiping out his army wiping out Dujek's support and potentially is trying to kill him. So here we have the High Fist, the general of the army, the person in control of the entire campaign, believing that the most powerful mage, who's ostensibly on his side, is, is trying to kill him, kill his army, and, and just basically wipe everything out. And because this is following the Siege of Peel battle, Dujek knows that Tayshrin is either deliberately responsible for, knowingly contributed to, or negligently allowed a huge chunk of Dujek's army to be killed and some of them to be buried alive and then die in those tunnels. And this was all because Tayshrin had this plan. The mages are going to take care of it and we're going to take care of Rake. And suddenly Dujek has just had his military strength significantly reduced. So from a strategic point of view, this is bad. But also Dujek, as we know, has the common touch. He, he knows his soldiers. He likes his soldiers. His soldiers are loyal to him. They like him. And so this is significantly significantly reduced the support for Dujek um, personally, because obviously a lot of the soldiers he knew had been commanding for years have now died. So we have a personal loss. He's lost friends. He's lost soldiers he's worked with. We have the strategic loss. We have the fact that he doesn't know whether or not Tayshrin did this on purpose or just didn't care. And added to this, in this section, we are told that Tayshrin is deliberately countermanding Dujek's orders during the, uh, during the occupation of Peel. Um, and so here we have the High Fist, the commander of all of the armed forces in control of this entire campaign. And remember, Peel and Darugistan, that's just one part of it. He's in control of the military on the entire continent. And he is meant to be the central authority of the empire. And this mage is walking around, countermanding his orders, telling soldiers, no, go and do that instead. So Tayshrin is undermining Dujek at every available opportunity. And again, Tayshrin and, and Dujek obviously have a history, they know each other, but this is something that has to worry the commander of an army. And when Dujek meets up with Lorne, when Lorne comes into the city, 
Dujek reveals that Heishrin wants to have a cull of the nobility. Now, we know, and as Lauren says, this is imperial policy. You, you wipe out, you know, a bunch of the um, most corrupt nobles, uh, the wealthy nobles, and you steal all their wealth. You know, the Romans did it. This is imperial policy. You cut out the leaders and it makes the population easier to control. And Lorne doesn't know why Dujek has a problem with this. But of course, Dujek says, no, Tatian wants to kill nine out of 10 nobles, including the children. And even Lorne is taken aback by this because this, this is an excessive interpretation of what the empire had done in the past and what the empire what their policy actually is. And as uh, later on in the, in the chapter, Tattersale actually is thinking about the, imper uh, the imperial cull policy. And she says like, the reason for it is they can blame past ills on the corrupt nobles and the empire then can, by killing off the corrupt nobles, be seen less as invaders and more as saviors and liberators. And by removing a lot of the nobles at the top, it allows citizens that are lower down to ascend into more powerful roles. So they benefit from the empire taking over. It is a tried and, and tested method of dividing rebellion and rebellious instinct in the populace. Because if some people are going to benefit from this, and let's face it, a lot of them are going to go, well, I never liked that noble anyway. This is a great way to consolidate support and to quickly assimilate a city, a conquered city, into the Malazan Empire. So Taishran's plan of publicly hanging nine out of ten nobles, including children, may not quite do the same thing. Um, so Dujek obviously having problems with, with Tatron. And now he's confronted with the fact that adjunct Lorne has arrived in the city. And Lorne is the hand of the Empress. She is the Empress's voice. She is uh, the, the Empress's will made incarnate, almost. And he knows she has her own agenda. And he doesn't know what that is. So he's not sure if she is here to help Tatron or if she is there to help Dujek or if she's there completely coincidentally. He doesn't know. So this is a very fraught meeting. And yet Dujek, in seeing Lorne, smiles at her. And is actually, you know, he, he knows her. They, they've worked together on imperial campaigns, like he's seen her about the palace. Although he is perhaps slightly wary, we get a sense that Dujek is willing to extend the olive branch first. And strangely enough, although Dujek is the supreme military commander, Lorne is outside of his command structure. But Lorne isn't his boss, but Lorne can order him to do things because she can speak for the empress. So she's a proxy for the empress, but not the empress. So it's a, a very strange power dynamic between the two of them. Um, and Dujek has a, a brilliant line, uh, which sort of spells a lot of this out because they're, they're discussing um, Lorne arriving in the city and she says that she's not really going to interfere in what's going on and she has her own mission. And Dujek just simply says, I don't want any details adjunct. You do what you have to do and just stay out of my way. And he, he's blunt and plain spoken in this regard. There's no artifice to what he's doing. He says, listen, I know you have a job to do. I have my job to do. I have enough problems at the minute with Tatian. I don't need you getting involved. You do what you have to do. I'll do my job. We'll just leave each other alone. And, you know, it's this, this wonderful moment, but it spells out the kind of tension here, that there is this subtext that Lorne has her own objective. 
Lauren has her own job, her own mission, and her own agenda. Dujek is much more public about what his agenda is. And therefore, he's at a disadvantage. Lauren knows exactly what Dujek is up to. Dujek has no idea what Lauren is up to. So there's a, there's a tension built between these two characters. And obviously, the third person referred to is Tayshrin, who is also going to be in the mix. Now, added to all of this, Lorne has appeared in the city with Tok the Younger. And Tok the Younger, although a scout in the Second Army, is a claw. He's an assassin. He's a spy. In fact, as Dujek notes, he's, he's the only official claw on the entire continent. So what does it say about Adjunct Lorne showing up at the gates of Pale with the only official claw on the continent. Dujek has to take that into consideration. And what's interesting is, again, Tok has split loyalties because he is an officer in the army. Well, he's a, he serves in the second army and he's a scout and he is well liked even though everyone knows he's a claw. But as Dujek says, they, they, don't, they don't really want the claw in the city at the minute because he likes talk, then Lorne should really get him the hell out of the city as soon as possible. Um, so there's something else going on here. I mean, talk is respected, he's liked. People knew he was a claw, but he's part of the army. Why is he suddenly in danger? And Dujek obviously later on reveals that he knew Tok's father. So there's a history here and there's a relationship here that is hinted at, but also a tension simmering in the city that a claw is not going to be welcome, even if that claw is Tok. So there's something going on. Um, Lorne and Dujek have a discussion then about whether or not Dujek is going to get his reinforcements for the campaign to begin again in the spring. And Lorne breaks the bad news that he's getting very little. Now Dujek immediately knows if that is all he is getting, there is something else going on here. Lorne admits in her own internal dialogue that she does not understand strategy. She doesn't know what Dujek is looking at on the map or what Dujek is figuring out or what Dujek is, is working out because of the strategic information. She's just delivered, you're only getting these, these people. Dujek's asked for them um, to be left in different places for the order to be reversed, that um, they actually be sent to the other places. And Lauren doesn't know why, gets Dujek to explain and Dujek runs through the tactical advantages and how he would do this. And you can see that Lauren's kind of following it, but she doesn't really understand this. This is not her forte. Military strategy, material, supplies, tactics. This is not what she does. She is a very different sort of political animal. He's a military animal. And then she realizes that Dujek has spotted something because he goes silent. And he basically has said, this is all academic because he's worked out something and he's not going to tell her. So Lorne is now on the back foot because beforehand she had all of this information. She had all of the power. She has her own agenda, knows what she's up to. But Dujek didn't know. And now Dujek knows something that she doesn't know. And she's curious about it, but she doesn't know what to do about it. And then we, we get into the fact that Lorne says to Dujek, right, I'll back you up in terms of dealing with Tayshrin, in terms of sorting out this issue with the cull. Like, you have my support. We'll, we'll sort this out. And Dujek basically says, you know, that, that's great and all, but just stay out of my way. I'll deal with Tayshrin myself. You don't need to do anything that there are strategies that work on the battlefield that can work in this sort of political maneuvering. So she offers her help, but Dujek essentially um, refuses it. 
So again, we have this byplay about who's, who's in power here, who's in control here, who knows what's going on, that they are each holding back this information. And there's a sort of a dance, a um, not quite a duel, but they're dancing around these various issues, trying to get more information out of the other one than they are giving away. And this leads to Lorne contemplating Dujek's loyalty, the army's loyalty, and what's going on. Now, she knows that Dujek had been loyal to the emperor, but she also thinks that Dujek is loyal to the empire as a concept. Maybe not necessarily loyal to the scene, but loyal to the empire. What she's more concerned about are the men um, and the women serving in the armed forces because she asks, about, you have a lot of people from seven cities here. And Dujek's, yeah, yeah, you know, we've, we've been together a while. We've been on a couple of campaigns. The army is loyal to Dujek. The army is not necessarily loyal to Lassine or to the empire. And that concerns Lorne. That's a political problem. So it's not necessary that she doubts Dujek's loyalty itself it's more that she's doubting where the loyalty of the soldiers lies and of course she's seen all of these soldiers lined up uh, with their hands on their weapons as she and Dujek have been walking along and she asks about this and Dujek goes well you know there have been four assassination attempts on my life in the last week you know I could tell them to go away but they're not listening to me this this is said almost as an aside. He's had four attempts on his life in the last week. And the last one, the soldiers hit repeatedly so much, he couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman lying there afterwards. So um, th there's a lot going on. Who's organizing these assassination attempts? What we've just heard about Tashrin, is it Tashrin? Has he been hiring assassins? Is it rebellious people within the populace? trying to do this and of course then this brings up this the, the whole enfilade the the mage battle uh, at peel and dujek mentions that tattersail was the only one to survive the only cadre mage to have survived tatron's assault on moonspawn and lorne has this odd reaction to this piece of information about Tattersail. She says, indeed. And then we get the, the line, to Lorne, that revelation was even more remarkable. She wondered if Dujek suspected anything, but his next words put her at ease because he just carries on with the conversation. But suddenly Erickson drops this little hint that there's something between Lorne and Tattersail. And he has that echo at the end of the whole thing where she she whispers mouse and, and tatter sail. But we then have Tashrin come stumbling into this meeting. He's running late, he's harassed, he's annoyed, and he's really annoyed at Dujek. And immediately, before any of the civil niceties, he has a go at Dujek because Dujek has, you know, for whatever, uh, however it was organized, uh, burned all of the civil records about who was a noble and who wasn't. He's burned all the census records. And Tayshun goes, I know it was, basically going, I know it was you, you're, and he's really annoyed. And Dujek said, well, would you like some help? I can assign some people to you. And Tayshun immediately replies with, what, and interfere with the spies you already have? You know, it is clear the two of them do not like each other. The two of them are working at counter purposes. There's a lot of animosity there. But Dujek is being calm because Dujek's in control. Dujek's taking care of the problem. Dujek's going, Tayshrin, he's not an issue. Tayshrin, on the other hand, is really annoyed because he, he keeps being stymied in what he's trying to do by someone who he pretty much considers his inferior. Lorne then makes a very deliberate point by scrupulously thanking Dujek for the wine and the conversation in front of Tayshrin. And that's when Tayshrin sort of goes, oh crap, 
Lauren's here. I was just yelling at Dujek. That's that's not how we do things when we're human. Um, and so he he sort of takes this as a very polite dressing down that he has not observed the proper niceties. He's not going about things the right way. And when Dujek leaves, um, Lorne basically is annoyed at Tayshrin because Dujek is outplaying him. Not that Tayshrin was wrong to do the things that he did. She's not going, Tayshrin, you're an idiot. How could you have done that? How could you have caused those things? How could you have done it? No, she goes, Dujek is outplaying you. And remember, this is the same woman that moments ago had promised to support Dujek against Tayshrin. And she's just turned to Tayshrin and said, you're an idiot. He is making you look like an idiot. You're a fool. And so because Dujek's no longer in the room, Lauren is suddenly almost like a different, well, she's not a different person. She has a completely different argument that she's advancing. Um, and they have this, this whole discussion about Dujek, about the army. And I'll, I'll read a, a, a section of it. Well, I'm going to cut out a couple of bits and pieces. But essentially, she's talking about the Empress. And she says uh, she reluctantly approved your commandeering the assault on Moonspawn. But if she'd known you'd so thoroughly lacked subtlety, she never would have permitted it. Do you take everyone else for fools? Dujek's not the enemy, she said wearily. Dujek's never been the enemy. Patron stepped forward. He was the emperor's man. Um, so clearly, the empress, Lorne, Tatron, were all in this plan to get rid of those people loyal to the emperor, to weaken those forces within the empire that were loyal to Kelimved and not Messine. Um, she has the line, all who stood with the emperor and still cling to his memory will ever work against us, whether consciously or unconsciously. Dujek is an exception, and there's a handful of others like him, those we must not lose. As for the others, they have to die. The risk lies in alerting them to that fact. If we're too open, we may end up with an insurrection the size of which could destroy the empire. So, Lysine... Lorne and Tayshrin obviously have no compunction about killing off loyal members of the Empire because they are loyal to the Empire, not to Lysine. These are cold, calculating professionals. And the reason Lorne is annoyed is because Tayshrin has screwed up the plan because he lacks subtlety. And that is something that you just go, whew. For all of the banter and exchange that she had with Dujek, and you sort of go, well, you know, maybe she's not so bad. This is suddenly a sort of brutal revelation. And that paranoia that Whiskey Jack had had earlier on, where they were talking about these things, the paranoia that the bridge burners were feeling about um, so many of them being buried alive, that paranoia isn't unjustified. People are out to get them. And so we have that suggestion earlier on being confirmed now in a private conversation between two of the most powerful people in the empire. And the person excluded from that is the commander of that army. So this is a really interesting setup of all of this. And the one last thing is, Lorne then says to, to Tatian, but before you do, the Empress requests that you continue your efforts, though not against Dujek. She actually emphasizes this. She said Dujek's not the enemy. She said that she doesn't want Dujek touched. But she still emphasizes, leave Dujek alone, as if Tatian wouldn't have gotten it the first couple of times. And why would she think that? Because Tatian has so thoroughly screwed up their plan because he lacks subtlety. And so she is making things as plain as possible. So this actually gives you an insight into Tayshrin. He might be massively powerful. 
he might be able to do all of these things, but he's not subtle. He's not cunning. He is, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it, but don't ask me to come up with complex plans. That's not what I do. And so in this exchange, we actually find out a lot about Taishran's character. Um, and of course, she finishes by saying, do not involve yourself with the managing the with managing the occupation of pale. It's like you have done enough. Dujek's outplayed you. He's smarter than you. He knows what he's doing. You look like an idiot. You've screwed up the plan thus far. Just stay out of it. You need to stay here in case we need you. That's all that we want. You know, with stuff going on in, in Darugistan, you need to be around in case that all goes south. But stay the hell out of everything else. And so we have this setup coming into the actual dinner. There's going to be a formal dinner. And we have these three people, all with completely different agendas, all with completely different politics, all with con completely different priorities that are all meant to be on the same side. And it's this setup that leads into the dinner scene. And what's interesting for me about the dinner scene is basically we're introduced to it through talk as an impartial sort of witness to it. Um, and we have Dujek, the military commander. We have Taishrin, the high mage in control of the mage cadres. We have Lorne, the political sort of voice. And then we have talk who um, Dujek says, as Claw representative, you're representing that, so the secret police and spies. But Tok is also a military man, and Dujek is essentially his commanding officer. So Tok has a boss there. The only boss that the other three have is Lassine. Dujek reports to Lassine. Lauren reports to Lassine. Taishrin reports to Lassine. Yes, they may be all in the same thing, and they can, Lorne can approve things on Lassine's behalf, or she can give orders to Dujek on Lassine's behalf, but Lorne isn't Dujek's boss. And Dujek can say, well, adjunct, you're doing that thing, but I need to do this. And in certain respects and in certain areas, he could actually give her orders. But again, he's not her boss. And Taishrin, exactly the same thing, that the three of them are kind of equal in power level. And then you have talk. Talk, who is ostensibly the claw representative, therefore meant to be on par with these other three, because he's representing the claw and the claw reports to Lassine. But he's not a claw master. He's not the head of the claw. He doesn't report directly to Lassine. He's a soldier and he's a claw way down in the ranks. So he is outmatched here, but he's a trained spy. He's a trained assassin. He's a trained soldier. Like he has skills. He has these abilities. So it's going to be interesting in his perspective. And of course, the last person who comes in is Tattersail. Her boss, Taishrin, is sitting there. And we know that there's a history between Taishrin and Taishrin and, and Tattersail don't necessarily get along. Tattersail's just lost all of her friends. Taishrin doesn't seem cut up about it. But her boss is sitting right there. But she's also assigned to the army. So Dujek is also her other boss. So she's going into this room with her two bosses sitting there, her two commanders sitting there. So she's the only one who is not representing something. The others all represent something. And she's the only one there basically as an individual. And then we see and find out about the whole relationship between Tattersail and Lorne. And this is all going to be witnessed by talk. And the play of the different power dynamics here is absolutely fascinating. Because when talk comes in, it Lorne is the one who greets him, welcomes him, and says, yes, you come on in, as if she is the host. She is the one in charge. She is the most power. And when talk is obviously self-conscious about his new injury, the fact he's, he's lost an eye, Dujek goes out of his way to scratch his own very visible um, injury, the, the, the stump of his arm. 
to make talk feel at home. So again, we have this warmth towards Dujek that we don't have towards Lorne or Tayshrin. And talk has warmth towards Dujek that he doesn't necessarily feel towards Lorne or Tayshrin. And then Tattersail comes in. And of course, talk and Tattersail have served in the same army. They've chewed the same dirt. She and the other mages have saved his life and he as a soldier has saved their, their lives. You know, there was always this, always an even exchange. The mages and the soldiers were different, but they worked together to protect each other. So there is a loyalty between Tok and Tattersail. And of course, I've just discussed all of the things going on in the top three. So we have this very complex power dynamic. And of course, when Lorne says about Tattersail leading the, the mage cadre in the destruction of the mouse quarter and how within a week, although her family survived, they died basically in a dungeon, forgotten, and she was left an orphan, all because of Tattersail. Your heart suddenly goes out towards Lorne because that was a terrible thing to happen. And we as readers love Tattersail at this point. Like Tattersail's great. She's been a point of view character. We've identified with her. And we find out that she's this monster that basically set fire to a quarter of the city. Killed all of these people. That resulted in the deaths of all of the, a lot of the survivors because they just got basically dumped in a dungeon and no one cared for them and they died of starvation and disease. Erickson undercuts our... Uh, acceptance and our appreciation and our connection to Tattersail and brings it over to Lorne and suddenly makes Lorne look like a victim. That we should feel compassion for Lorne and scorn for Tattersail. And of course, Tattersail, and we've known that she's had this burden, like we've, it's been signaled that the, this was coming. And we know from Lauren's little uh, line earlier that this was going to be about the mouse. And we saw this in the prologue. We witnessed this. We saw this from the position of Gano's Paran and Whiskey Jack looking down over it. And Erickson was at pains to point out the smell of the abattoir or the burning human flesh. And the fact that Whiskey Jack had to order Dujek one arm down to rein in the mages. We saw this at the beginning of the book and now suddenly we understand its relevance here. And when we have Tattersail then stand there in front of Lorne and Lorne immediately calls for a trial because this is the woman responsible for her family's death, for the death of civilians, for the death of citizens. This woman standing here in front of them is responsible and needs to pay. Lorne until this point has been so cold, so calculating. And then suddenly here is the human Lorne crying out for vengeance, for revenge, for payback, that these are human emotions. And there's a lot going on. There, there are ascendants and gods wandering around. There are these big military plans. There's a campaign. There's a city to take. Hounds of shadow have been seen. There's a lot happening. And Lorne takes one look at Tattersail and goes, I want this woman dead. And Dujek has to step in. And he's, no, you can't have a trial. That's absolutely ridiculous. It was in the past, but not only that, you're going to put her on trial? Think of all the things that the rest of us have done, that I have done, that Tayshun has done, that you have done. We have done things in the service of the empire that would have us all hanged. And not only that, Whiskey Jack had, uh, or Empress Lucine came up with that edict and ordered the, um, the mages to do it. I was sent down to rein them in. We did this, all of us. So you cannot blame Tattersail. You have to blame all of us here in this room. 
And the surprising thing, Hatron steps in. Hatron backs up Tattersail. And you go, why is Tatron backing up Tattersail against Lorne? Backing up Dujek against Lorne? It's, it's this really interesting question. And again, it shows this complexity of character. And I don't have an exact answer for this. Apart from the fact I think maybe Tatron realizes, no, you can't blame everything on the what's past is past. It could be Tatron's going, yeah, what was your family? Big deal. Everyone had family that died. Or it could be that he goes, no, she's a mage. I'm in charge of the mages. You stick to your side of the aisle. I'll stick to mine. Or it could be you dress me down earlier. You make fun of me earlier. Fine. This is in my control. You're going to look like an idiot. We don't know. But we can read different things into it depending on how we're interpreting Tatron. But Tattersail, out of all of them, is the one that goes, no, I, I, that was bad. That was my mistake. Um, I, that was my first mission. I resigned my commission the next day. I was then talked back into joining the army, was sent out into a well-established, well-oiled veteran machine to get some control and to work out my issues and and then was brought into the second and I have served every day since then with that guilt knowing that I that never has to happen again and we we suddenly feel compassion for Tattersail again like Erickson is just ripping our emotions backwards and forwards in this scene all because he has set everything up beforehand and then we get to Tattersail's devastating moment where she goes, I'll challenge you to a duel, your sword against my majory. And in Talk witnessing this, Talk, because of his loyalty to Tattersail, wants to speak out and say, Tattersail, you'll die. She has an Tatteral sword. It's going to absorb all of your magic. And then Talk realizes that, yeah, of course Tattersail knows this. Tattersail knows that she's going to die. She feels that she should after what she did. And again, Dujek steps in and goes, no, it's done. It's over. Lorne, remember your place. You're the adjunct of the, the Empress. And he shuts her down so hard. And in that moment, I don't know if you, you've ever seen this, where someone's been really, really upset, and then suddenly they've just, they're, they've just gone cold. They've become inhuman. They've just shut down. It's almost like... And in that moment, Lorne, the person, is gone forever. That little girl, that fragment of that little girl who'd been orphaned and who'd been trained to this position, there was a tiny fragment of humanity left in her. And in that moment, it is absolutely destroyed and crushed. And she becomes the iron will of the Empress. And the ramification for that is now think of how the events at the end of Gardens of the Moon could have been changed if that humanity had been allowed to live. If that humanity had been allowed to grow. If it hadn't been crushed in that moment and all she had left was just the empty enacting of the Empress's will. So that was kind of, that dinner scene is so powerful to me because the ramifications of it, which you're unaware of when you read it, but when you get to the end, you suddenly realize that that dinner scene is so pivotal to the moments and the decisions at the end of Gardens of the Moon. And that dinner scene only works because of what preceded it in the chapter that set up all of the power dynamics. So this has just been a, a look at that, that scene. I haven't touched on everything. I haven't you know, talked about every aspect of it. I haven't talked about every aspect of Lorne, but I just wanted to go into that to show how complex and intricate and interconnected this writing is to tease those things out and how competent the, the writing is 
that all of these little threads tie back together again. So I hope you enjoyed this and I will catch you in the next one.